So, very exciting. A new book by Asma Gloon Robinson is always an event for the politics of development crowd. And on this occasion, I think, and, and actually judging from the reception of the last book, My Nations Fail, it's, it's, it's an event beyond the, uh, this uh, politics and development world. Um, and uh, it hasn't, this is in fact, I think, pre-print copies, is that right? Yeah. These have just come out, and you can get them out there. I don't know why I'm selling this to you. I don't think you need my help at all. Yeah, but, uh, it's the first time I've seen it. Oh, oh really? Well, have a look. Yeah. It looks great. It looks great. Um, and I, I, Sam kindly sent me uh, the review in Newsweek. It was in Newsweek, is that right? Yes. That's right, Newsweek. Yes. And it, it was described as breath, breathtakingly erudite. And, <laughs> and it's... Uh, and yet, it's also, and this is very important, and this is also very relevant, because Alice in Wonderland said, what's the good of a book without pictures? It's full of pictures, really good pictures. So I think it's really, really exciting. We're very, very pleased to have you here. It really is a privilege for us. And now I'm going to introduce you properly. So James Robinson is director of the Pearson Institute for the Study and Resolution of Global Conflicts at the University of Chicago, a prominent political scientist and economist, James has conducted influential research on the underlying relationship between poverty and the institutions of society and how institutions emerge out of political conflicts. He has published many landmark books and articles, including Why Nations Fail, of course, The Origins of Power, Prosperity and Poverty, as well as The Economic Origins of Dictatorship and Democracy, both with Darren Asimoglu. His talk this evening will draw on their latest collaboration, The Narrow Corridor, State Societies and the Fate of Liberty, um, copies of which are available there, and it could not be more timely. Um, Professor Robinson is going to speak for about 45 minutes or so, and then we're going to have whatever time is left for Q&A. So keep, keep, your, uh, you know, keep making your notes to ask the questions, and over to you. Thank you very much. Okay. Great, thank you. Is, it, is this working? No. Okay, he told me to push it hard. I'll push it harder. It's working. Huh? It's working? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. All right, thank you. Thanks very much for that introduction, and thanks very much for, for, for inviting me uh, to David and, and, and Sam, who invited me. Um, I, I, um, I came about three years ago to this Development Studies Conference in Oxford, and I had a lot of fun because, because, because the discussion, you know, it's all the sort of things that I'm interested in, but which have been sort of driven out of academic development economics in the United States. Uh, or even in Britain, for that, for that matter, you know, where it's not intellectually acceptable anymore to actually talk about comparative development and ask, you know, why is it that some parts of the world are much more successful economically than others? That's just a question that's not answerable uh, methodologically, so we can't talk about it. But, you know, that's why I got interested in social science a long time ago, so I'm going to carry on talking about it. And so it's very nice to be able to be in a kind of group of kindred uh, spirits talking about it. Uh, so, um, and I'm also, you know, not, I've never been in Manchester before, it's rather exciting, you know, and I'm not complaining about the rain because I vividly remember when I was at school in England and it was the Industrial Revolution came up in history, it was explained that one of the reasons why the Industrial Revolution happened in Britain and in particular why Manchester was because it was so wet <laughs> and it, it, it was so moist that the cotton threads uh, didn't, didn't break, you see, when you, when you were spinning them. <laughs> so uh, I think nowadays, you, you're, you, nowadays we're, we're rightly skeptical about this theory of the Industrial Revolution. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, it's nice to experience it firsthand. Okay, great. So I'm going to talk about our new book, The Narrow Corridor. Uh, and, and, you know, here's a way I haven't quite, I haven't quite, I haven't quite got the right way of talking about this, you'll probably see as you go along. But uh, here's one way of thinking about you know, what, what this book is about. So 30 years ago, you know, soon, 30 years ago, the Berlin Wall came down. And lots of us thought that this was going to precipitate some mass sort of convergence to something like liberal democratic institutions. Of course, Francis Fukuyama became very famous for for his thesis of the end of history. You know, he didn't make so much a positive argument. It was more a kind of normative arguments, you know, but I believe neither the pos positive argument nor the normative argument, and our book is really much more about the positive argument, okay? So, 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 so he thought there was going to be a convergence to political systems that sort of were characterized by, by, by liberty, you could, you could say, okay? So, so you could think of this book as trying to propose a sort of parsimonious 
theory for explaining, you know, why there's such variation in the extent of liberty in the world, okay? So probably, you know, what distinguishes me from, from, from you know, the crowd here is that, you know, I come out of a piece of the kind of intellectual closet where, where you know, parsimony, we try to write parsimonious theory down of really complicated things. And, you know, but, but we're all trying to ex understand the same stuff. And the question is, you know, what type of theory works and what doesn't. It's a kind of dialectical process. So just because I have a parsimonious theory, you're probably going to think it's too parsimonious. And I'm going to think your theory is not parsimonious enough. And we can meet in the middle. <laughs> so, OK. So let me start, since it's about liberty, let me, what does liberty mean? OK, so here's a specific definition of liberty that Daron and I like which is due to the Princeton political philosopher, Philip Pettit. And Pettit has this very nice idea of kind of called non-dominance, okay? So, so his notion of liberty is connected to this idea of non-dominance, okay? So, so here's, you know, here's freedom from dominance, okay? And particularly, Pettit kind of argues that it's unacceptable to live at the mercy of another, having to live in a manner that leaves you vulnerable to some ill that another person is in a position arbitrarily to impose. Okay? So, so, so this is more like, oops, oh gosh, ah, gosh, okay, all right, careful. Okay. Uh, so dominance, you know, he uses this word dominance, but it's quite intuitive what dominance means. It's the fact that, you know, it's very closely to relate to, related to the notion of negative liberty, that somebody has the ability to stop you doing what you want, put constraints on you, control you, okay? So not being dominated is what we're going to call liberty, okay? And it's a sort of liberation from the dependency on others, okay? Or their power of arbitrary interference with you. So this is going to be a, oh, it's like feast or famine. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'm really good. Uh, okay, this is going to, okay. So, but th so this is a, that's, that's very brief and we can come back to it. But, but it's, a, it's going to be a positive theory. Okay. So, so we'd like to explain the variation in the world in liberty. So, so, you know, probably the first idea that comes to mind might be, Hobbes, okay? Hobbes had this idea that he had an idea of where liberty came from. He had a particular notion of sort of illiberty, you know, a state of, you know, what he called war. Uh, and the solution to this problem of war, where there was not much liberty, you were very much under the control and threat of others, the solution was to create a leviathan. Okay, there it is. Okay. But probably all of us think it's not sufficient to have a state, a Leviathan, the way Hobbes conceived of it. We'd also be worried about the governance of the state. So it didn't take Locke very long to point that out, about, what, 40 years or less. And what Locke said, you know, in the famous passage, are men so foolish to think that they, they could, th are men so foolish to avoid the mischiefs done by polecats and foxes that they risk being devoured by lions, okay? So the state of war, there's dominance, but it's the dominance of polecats and foxes. But if you build a state, you created a lion. So how do you control the lion? How do you stop the lion devouring you? Okay. So Locke, of course, you know, had a notion of sort of institutional design. You know, you need popular participation. You need checks and balances. You know, he even talks about the separation of powers. And Pettit, when Pettit talks about how do you achieve a society with non-dominance, he sort of has the same idea, okay? A kind of constitutional design problem. I put the John Locke, James Madison solution up here because ever since then there's been this notion, you know, in Western society that you, if this is an institutional design problem. You have separation of powers, you have checks and balances, you have this kind of independent supreme court. So it's a sort of institutional design problem, okay? So I want to start questioning that, and I'll question it with a very specific historical example. And then I'm going to back up and ask, you know, is it right? Is, that, is it right that, you know, liberty emerges in this particular way in places which are, liberty is all relative, you know? But, but I think we can probably agree on which parts of the world have more liberty than others. So I'm going to focus on Europe, in particular, Western Europe, and ask, you know, what's, what's the right story about, historical story about the emergence of liberty? 
Okay. But before I get to that, I want to criticize a little bit this constitutional design sort of approach to thinking about liberty. And I'm going to do it by telling you about the world's first system of checks and balances. You know, you probably thought Locke, maybe Montesquieu, did the Athenians have that? Old news, okay? You have to go back 4,200 years to the city of Uruk. And there's a famous uh, epic, the Epic of Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh was the king of Uruk. And Gilgamesh did great things. He built temples and walls. Here's, a, here's the, ooh, sorry. Oh, gosh, I'm really incompetent with this. Here's the remains of one of the temples mentioned in the Gilgamesh epic. There were markets and trade, and it was a fabulous thing, Uruk. But there was a problem. Gilgamesh was out of control. Okay? He was ravishing women. He was tyrannizing people, trampling his citizens like a wild bull, it says in the epic. So what did the people of Uruk do? Oh, man. Okay. They cry out to heaven. They cry out to Anu, the god of the sky, and say, Gilgamesh is great, but he's out of control. What, 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 do something. And Anu creates the world's first system of, maybe the world's first documented system of checks and balances. Okay? What does Anu do? Anu sends a doppelganger to Earth called Enkidu, an identical version of Gilgamesh, to check, check him and balance him. Okay? Sounds a bit eccentric, but actually if you think about it, if you think about ethnographically, there's many types of societies where kind of balanced opposition had the effect of controlling power. You know, maybe in the Somali clans or an Igbo village or... So, so it's not too strange once you start thinking about it. Anyway, Enkidu comes to Earth. The first scene, Gilgamesh is just about to ravish some bride. Enkidu blocks the doorway. Problem solved. Not quite. Here's the problem, okay? Soon, they embrace like brothers. They kiss, they walk side by side, okay? In the language of economic theory, this particular sort of system of checks and balances wasn't collusion proof. <laughs> they get together, they kill the bull of heaven. I won't go into the story. But what I'm going to point out is that there's something missing, which I think is like really crucial from this story. Okay? The story of asking Anu or James Madison or, you know, for, for, for a system of checks and balances. There's no society. Where is society? Okay. So, so, so uh, what I'm going to start by arguing, this is Gilgamesh killing the bull of heaven. What I'm going to start by arguing is that if I go back in the history of Europe and I ask, you know, where did these political institutions come from that we associate with liberty or even Pettit associates with liberty, I'm going to say you can't think about that without thinking about the role of society. This is not some clever in elite institutional design problem. This is something which is contested and created and by society. Okay? So, so where do I start? Okay. Well, here's a place to start. Tacitus' description in Germania of the German tribes. Okay? So this was a book written in 98 AD by Tacitus, Roman uh, historian, sort of intellectual, Tacitus was interested in the Germans. He was interested in the Germans because the Romans kept on losing battles to the Germans. So this is an almost like ethnographic account of German society and, you know, what the heck is going on with these Germans, okay? And here's a little bit where Tacitus describes the political systems of the Germans. Over matters of minor importance, only the chiefs debate. On major affairs, the whole community, the assembly, is competent also to hear criminal charges, especially those involving the risk of capital punishment. The assemblies elect magistrates, etc. Okay, so Tacitus paints this picture of an extremely participatory form of government. Roll on a few hundred years. The Western Roman Empire collapses. <coughs> Why does it collapse? The Germanic tribes are doing what Germanic tribes did. Invading, conquering, okay, ransacking, this gentleman is called Clovis, okay? He was the king of the Franks. Clovis was an amazing institutional engineer, 
Okay? What he did was he took these very participatory assembly type politics and he fused them with late Roman state institutions, legal institutions, fiscal institutions, administrative institutions, when he founded the Frankish state. The earliest observation of an assembly that we have comes from quite a long time after Clovis was doing his thing. It's by a gentleman called Hinkmar in 882. At that time, the custom was followed that no more than two general assemblies were to be held each year. Those of lower station were present in order to hear the decisions and to deliberate concerning them and to confirm them, not out of coercion, coercion but by their own understanding and agreement. Okay, so it right down to the two assemblies. So, so you know, the, what's amazing about this description is that it's very similar to Tacitus' description of the Germanic tribes. Okay, here's what Clovis did. Clovis did lots of things. One thing he did was promulgate the Salic law. Okay, here's a preface of a surviving version of the Salic law. Therefore, four men, chosen out of many amongst them, stood out. Their names were Wizogast, Arrogast, Salogast, and Widogast. It's like, it's like Lord of the Rings. <laughs> okay? They came from, you know, beyond the Rhine. That's where the Franks came from. Coming together in three legal assemblies, and three legal assemblies, and discussing the origins and cases carefully, they made blah, blah, blah. So how did, where did the Salic law come from? Clovis, he was king, you know, crowned himself in purple, like the Romans, called himself Caesar. He, what, what was he doing? He should have, shouldn't he have been writing the legal code? This, the Salic law is a sort of, it's, a, it's an attempt to systematize social norms of the Franks. Okay, so if you look at it, it's not some giant top-down engineering control of society. It's, it's a codification of social norms, of feuding principles. There's page after page of, if I cut your left finger off, you have to pay this much. If you cut this finger off, you know, if you, if, you cut your, if you cut your eye out, you know, but you're not blind, then anyway. So it's social norms. It's a very bottom-up process. Clovis was just orchestrating it along with Wizogast, Aragast, Salagast, and Widogast. So what I'm emphasizing here is that, you know, for me, you know, the history of European distinct, this is the history of European distinctiveness. You know, if you think about the profusion of parliaments all over Western Europe and North, where did that come from? This, this is where it came from, okay? So, let me, this is like a very fast tour of history. <laughs> let me come to Britain, okay? Now, 1215, Runnymede Meadow, probably lots of you have been to Runnymede, okay? King John and the barons get together, they sign the Magna Carta. Does anyone know why they did it in Runnymede? They got together and they negotiated it. They signed it. Then they went to the pub for a drink. <laughs> why, why here? Like, why, why not? Why here? There's a reason here, okay? Because these same participatory institutions, they came to Britain, Anglo-Saxons. Who were the Saxons? Saxons were a Germanic tribe. They came, okay? Uh, they had a version of this assembly called the Witten. This was a place where Anglo-Saxon Wittens used to meet. Okay, so it was an extremely significant place to sign the Magna Carta. And it indicates enormous amount of continuity with these Anglo-Saxon institutions from before the Norman conquest. Okay, so, so it's again, you know, if you look at King Alfred's legal codes, it's very similar to the Salic law. So it's a sort of bottom-up codification of social norms. It's not some top-down social engineering project. Okay? Uh, let me keep going forward. Let's stay in Britain. Uh, what, did Britain what did Britain look like? I'm talking about this, there's state institutions, but there's a huge amount of participation here. Okay? A famous window on the extent of participation and kind of popular control of institutions is uh, in a place called Swallowfield in Wiltshire in 1596. So, so this was, these, uh, these records were discovered by a historian, and it basically it's a little constitution of Swallowfield has survived. Okay? So a group of people used to get together. They wrote this constitution. The whole company promises to meet once in every month. They met regularly. 
They had a book. They were kind of bureaucratized. They wrote down uh, what was going on. It's agreed, every man shall be heard at our meeting quietly, one after another. So when you read this Swallowfield kind of constitution, you get the picture that society was completely self-governing. You know, there were people, there was a village constable, there was, you know, there were local justices of the peace, but they were locals. They were not professional bureaucrats appointed by London. They were local, they were locally accountable and locally controllable. And what's interesting about this is that we have the names of these people, okay, who signed this document. The priest, the priest isn't there, and none of the local elites are there either. So actually, you kind of know who the richest people were from the from tax, Elizabethan tax records. None of them were at this meeting. So this wasn't elites bossing around people. It wasn't the priest. It was what historians of Britain call the middling sort of person. Okay, so it's a, it's very related if you know E. P. Thompson's work on. Uh, the moral economy of the English crowd. So, so, so E.P. Thompson, in a kind of later period, depicted this kind of autonomous sphere, uh, and it's very related to that. Now, I don't want you to get the image, and this is where the Red Queen is coming, I don't want you to get the image of there's a sort of balance, you know, there's like society, you leave us alone, and you know, we'll leave you alone, and there's the state, and there, there are the elites, and whatever, you know because there's a much more dynamic interaction going on. And that's what I want to emphasize here. And I'm going to do that with Charles Tilley's famous book, uh, Popular Participation in Great Britain, if you know this book. For me, I never believed any of that stuff about did war make states and states make war. I'm going to, and I'm going to explain that later on in about 15 minutes. But this, to me, is Tilly's greatest book. Okay? And Tilly started with this, and you'll see why it's relevant. Tilly started with this incredible puzzle, which was, if you look at the middle of the 18th century and you go through to 1830s, there's a dramatic change in British society. At the start of the period, if there's a depression or you know, unemployment, uh, people blame the baker. You know, he's gouging us. The price of bread is too high. You know? Or somebody, you know, the farmer is cutting wages. And it's like local parochial complaints. By the time you get to 1830, there's a business cycle depression. People are blaming the system. You know? People are acting collectively on a much larger, larger scale. The parochial complaints have disappeared, and they're complaining about the system. Okay? And Tilly asks, what on earth changes the nature of contestation like that? And the argument is, the state does it. Okay? Here's John Brewer's map of Supervisor Cowperthwaite's excise round. So this is in John Brewer's great book, The Sinews of Power. Remember I was telling you how in Swallowfield, there were some local state officials, but they were local people. They were unpaid. Not anymore. After the Glorious Revolution, excise tax bureaucracy spreads out through the country. And here it is, spreading out through uh, Yorkshire. Okay? Here's Supervisor Cowperthwaite. Here's the collectors. He's going around. Hmm. How much beer? How much beer are you making? How much bread are you making? Okay? The state is suddenly in your face. Okay? And Tilly's argument is that this, there's a massive reaction from society. Okay? So, good grief, there's state, suddenly this, we, need to, we need to control this thing. Okay? This is the Leviathan, it's emerging, we need to control it. So, what I find fascinating about this book is that it's this interaction. There's this kind of symbiotic relationship between the state and society. You know, the state, after 1688, gets more bureaucratized, it gets more powerful, you want to raise taxes, you need to create a bureaucracy, but society pushes back against that. And, you know, why does Tilly finish in 1833? Something happened in 1832. If you want to know what's happened in 1832, you should go to the People's Museum uh, in Manchester, where I was. So, 1832, the first Reform Act, okay? So, so how about that for a... Uh, so, this interaction is what we call the Red Queen effect. So, so, it's not just you establish this kind of balance between society and state institutions or state elites, but then there's a contest, there's a competition, okay? And that contest and competition is very productive, Okay? Because that creates much stronger states here. You know, it's, uh, you know, it's, uh, if you ever read Perry Anderson's Lineages of the Absolutist State, he talks about how absolutism 
was a sort of response to control society. So it's also in the flavor of that argument. There's many, it's putting together many kind of pieces of research into one framework. Okay? So it, that competition is very, very important, as you'll see. Okay, so uh, we have an expression. Well, let's, let's have some terminology, you know. What is it that, what sort of state emerged in Britain? Uh, uh, well, it was a Leviathan. It had a kind of Hobbesian, Leviathan-like control of society, but it was shackled. It was shackled by people. It was accountable to people. Okay? A particular type of governance emerged and that comp in that competition, which I'm calling the Red Queen effect. Okay? But it's hard to create something like this. Okay? So uh, let me consider China. China, if you go back into history in China, it's not so different. Okay? Third century BC. Here's a very famous philosophical work. I'll no doubt massacre the pronunciation. So oh, apologies to all Chinese people in the audience. The, the Hunzi. Okay. So apologies to all Chinese people. So here's a philosophical. Now I don't know Chinese, but I think the Chinese characters are so cute here that I couldn't resist putting it up in a slide. So let me just go through these. These not, here on the right here. King. So these are just chi the Chinese characters. King. Boat, common people, water, water holds up boat, water sinks boat. Okay? So, do I have to really spell it out for you? <laughs> the king is a boat. The common people are the water. The water holds up the boat, or the water can sink the boat. Okay? So that's, that's accountability. That's... that's Popular control, this is 3rd century BC, just as, just as it was about to be snuffed out by the emergence of the first uh, Chinese dynasty. Because after this thought, uh, oh, spoiling all the fun stuff, a very different model emerges. Okay? So this is one of the intellectual founders of the, the Qin state, although he, he, he was dead by the time the first dynasty appears. Lord Shang or Shang Yang. And his writings, the, 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 the selection of his writings that have come down to us, here's a famous expression. When the people are weak, the state is strong. Hence, the state that possesses the way strives to weaken the people. Now, I'm not sure, I, I'm not, not going to present a theory of the way <laughs> in this lecture. I asked one of my Taiwanese friends, can you explain, you know, this? can you kind of clarify what this idea of the way is? And he said to me, if I have to explain it to you, you won't understand it. <laughs> so you can jump over that if you like. But when the people are weak, the state is strong. Okay? So to make the state strong, you have to weaken the people. Okay? Now, this is a, the, one of the founders of the so-called legalist philosophy uh, in China. And if you look at the, what the Qin state did was that's exactly what they tried to do. Instead of a bottom-up Clovis-style state, they created a top-down micromanaged society state. We don't have the full Qin legal code. It, didn't, it doesn't survive, but the fragments that survive are radically different from the Salic law. It's a top-down micromanaging model of society, not a bottom-up model of participation, okay? And, you know, jumping over, doing even more egregious damage to history, you know, and, you know, you have to read the chapter. <laughs> this is the philosophy of the Chinese state today, okay? So it's the philosophy of the social credit system, and, you know, if you've been in Beijing recently, when George Orwell wrote his book, you know, it wasn't technologically possible for Big Brother to watch you, but now it, now, now it is, and, you know, as we speak, the Chinese are putting up hundreds of millions of these face recognition cameras everywhere. And this is uh, not liberty, according to Philip Pettit's definition. Okay? So, so what's this? That's a despotic Leviathan. We had a shackled Leviathan. Now we've got a despotic Leviathan. The way you should sort of think about this, I suppose, is when I talked about Clovis and the Germans and the late Roman Empire, there's a sort of balance emerges between the state and society. 
What happens here is that if you go far enough back in Chinese history, there's lots of evidence of similar things. But then it gets wiped out by the emergence of this particular model during the Warring States period. So the state crushes society. That's what we're calling a despotic leviathan. So logically, there should be a situation where society overwhelms the state. But how do I think about that? Well, you could think about it through the lens of the despotic Leviathan, meaning if you were worried that such a centralized institution could emerge, you might do everything you could to stop it. Okay? And we think there's many examples in world history of that. And I'm going to motivate that with, a, with an ethnographic example, uh, uh, not from one of the great Manchester School of Social Anthropologists. Actually, it's from the work of Paul Bohannon, who was an American and did his PhD at Oxford uh, and was a professor at Northwestern, just up the road from me for many years. Uh, but it's sort of a tribute to, 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 to uh, since he was supervised by Evans Pritchard, but to the sort of British social anthropology of Africa. So the reason, you know, Bohannon's work is amazing in many ways, but the reason I'm particularly, I find it particularly interesting is that he studied the TIV in, uh, this is a very contentious map, are there any Nigerians in the audience? Where, you know, this is a very, con when you put up a map of the ethnic groups in Nigeria, you know, that get, things get very heated. So this is like super crude and simplistic, uh, but this is just to give you a kind of vague notion that the TIV, here's McCurdy on the Benue River, the TIV, TIV people are kind of concentrated in this part of, of Nigeria uh, without wanting to take any of the, the details too seriously. Okay? So the TIV at the time of British colonization were, ah, there we go again. There's a, okay. The TIV at the time of the British colonization were, you know, what, uh, what anthrop social anthropologists of that period were called a stateless society. Okay. So they had chiefs, but chiefs didn't really do much. It, was a, it wasn't a small scale society, it was a big society, big cultural area with a lot of linguistic homogeneity, cultural homogeneity. It was what Bohannon at the time would have called the segmentary lineage society, so TIB people had a very elaborate notion of descent and genealogy, but there was no political centralization. There were no lawyers or policemen or whatever. Okay. And Bohannon was really interested in why that was. Okay. Why was it that TIB society was stateless? And what's interesting is that TIB people perfectly understood that there were advantages from centralized authority. But the question is, how could you create it and control it? And here's the example that Bohannon gives to kind of illustrate that. In the late 1930s, a cult called Nyambua emerged, and a gentleman called Kokwa came selling fetishes and charms. And in particular, he saw, well, you, gave, you, know, you gave him some money, you drank something, and he gave you this fly whisk. And the fly whisk was meant to search out witches. Okay. Uh, a word here which is very important to understand is the word sav, the tiv word sav. So sav means power, in particular sort of power over other people. Now when I used to teach at Harvard, I'd always give the example of Larry Summers, you know, the concept of Larry Summers. So Larry Summers is a very charismatic man, you know, he comes into the room, everyone turns around, he's very good at getting people to do what he wants. But the thing about, so he has sav, but the thing about sav is that some people just naturally have it, but it can also be accumulated via cannibalism. Okay? So, as Bohannon knows, men of sav, you can never really tell. Okay? You can never really tell. Now, oh, here's a tip divider. This is from Bohannon's photographs. You can see in his left hand there is a fly whisk for detecting fake counterfeit sav. So then, what is Bohannon? Oh my gosh, sorry, I'm, this is really painful. I see now why somebody was using the mouse earlier. Okay, all right, so, sav. Na people naturally have it, it can be accumulated illicitly through cannibalism. Now you need to understand the word mbatsav. Mbatsav, plural of sav, powerful people. Okay. Or a group of witches organized for nefarious purposes, robbing graves to eat the corpses. Okay. So 
Bohannon points out that this is a bit like the word politician having two meanings. Okay? Politician can mean people collectively organized to compete for public office, or a group of which is organized for nefarious <laughs> purposes, robbing greys to eat corpses. You know, it's a, that's a definition that seems more reasonable nowadays. <laughs> so what's this, what is this, what was, what's, up, what's up with this? Okay? Powerful people were never trusted. Okay? Powerful people were, were ground down by witchcraft accusations on the grounds that they could be witches illicitly accumulating charisma or authority through cannibalism. Okay? So anyone who was powerful was never trusted. And Bohemian points out, this is not, of course, in the 1930s, they were doing this to, 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 the, you know, to the warrant chiefs that were appointed in the British colonial period through this, through this process of indirect rule. But what Bohannon points out is that the oral history suggests this is, much, this is much more ancient. This is not something created by colonialism. And here's the key thing. Men who acquired too much power were whittled down by means of witchcraft accusations. Nambu was one of a regular series of movements to which Tiv political action with its distrust of power, so that's what I want to emphasize, distrust of power gives rise to, so that the, one, the, the system based on lineages and egalitarianism can be preserved. Okay? So it's not that the Tiv and there's other many, many ethnographically uh, observed examples of this in African. If you know the African anthropology, now Aidan Southall's book, The Allure, is maybe the best example of this. It's like fabulously documented that people understood there were benefits from public good provision. The question is, how do you create hierarchy and control it? Okay? So, so, so this society, I'm going to say, this is a society where there was no state. In some sense, you know, this was a polity where society was dominant. Remember, there's, there's this sort of triptych. You know. So now we, have, we had the balance, we had state dominating society, and now we have society dominating the state. Now you may say, well, you know, this is a kind of esoteric, ethnographic example. Okay? But actually, I don't think it is. You know, what, what goes on in Lebanon, for example? In Lebanon, the state is a kind of cipher. You know, authority is in the communities, not in the state in Beirut. So I think there's many examples of this in the, in the modern world, and it's not just a you know, historical anachronism. Okay, blah, blah, blah. All right. So here's the, exa here's the picture. Okay. So, so, so what I've been trying to <coughs> talk about is Imagine, you know, imagine Pettit and John Locke and Madison and all these people were right about what creates liberty. A state accountable to its uh, people, checks and balances, whatever. How does that, where does that come from? Okay. So what I try to argue, kind of albeit very perfunctorily, is in all the examples that we can think of, and there's a lot more of it in the book, you saw how thick it was, the role of society is absolutely crucial. Okay? The role of society, you, know, you don't get institutions that provide liberty or indeed economic development, in my opinion, through the beneficence of some elites. Okay? You get it because the people who have a vested interest in public good provision get involved and they force the system to produce it. Okay? So, so that's this narrow corridor in the middle. Okay? It's a process, you know. I went through hundreds of years of history. You know, no, history never repeats itself. It's not that developing underdeveloped you know, societies or societies that are not in the corridor today have to do what the Franks and the British and the Normans or whatever did. Okay? So I'm not saying that. This is, a, you know, this is a historical theory, like most of our work. We're trying to kind of understand these big patterns in the world. And, and you know, here's a parsimonious way of thinking about it. But, but what we, um, you know, we have mathematical models of this, but you know, we, we, what we try to kind of get, get across is just this idea that this balance, is, this balance is crucial, but it's hard to achieve. You know, it can tip either way. It can tip like the Qin Dynasty, where the state kind of creates a dominance over society, and then you don't get to Shackled Leviathan up here. You go off in this direction. Okay? But here's a, this is a, a theorem in the, paper, in, the, in the model, which is that that doesn't create 
So Lord Shang was wrong, okay? A weak society doesn't create a strong state. When I talked about Britain, I emphasized this com it's this competition that's crucial. It's the competition between state and society that actually builds high capacity, okay? If you dominate society, the state doesn't have to, you know, the society is prostate. You don't need to do much. So you give up. It's the race that's really crucial, okay? So strong state, strong society, okay? You could say down here, it's a bit like some of um, Joel Migdal's work on strong society, weak state. You know, in some sense, here, it's the power of society kind of basically uh, dominates the state, and the mechanism is, you know, what I try to illustrate with the TIV, which is this antagonism towards authority. You can't control it. You don't know it's going to act in your welfare. So, so what the book is about is just trying to essentially take these historical examples and see them through this lens of this very simple framework of this balance of power between the state and society, and then try to understand historically, you know, how is it that some societies have managed to get into this corridor and get this, what we call this red queen effect uh, going. How long do I have? Minus something? Um, yeah. It depends on how long we want to do an end talk. Uh, you could probably have 20 minutes. Oh, gosh, really? Okay. Hmm. I, won't, I won't talk for that much. I think I've got... Let me just put... Let me just talk about... I'm going to come back to that. But let me put the theory to work since I, 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 I like to beat up on Tilly. Okay, so, so, so there's the theory, okay? That's in a nutshell. How would I use the theory to talk about something, okay? Well, let's, give an, let's take an example, which is war made states and states made war, okay? You can see, first of all, from this diagram that any claim like that isn't going to make any sense, right? Because the consequences of a change in parameters or whatever, are going to be completely conditional on where you are, okay? So imagine the state, imagine a war, imagine a war does make the state stronger. That doesn't have the, that has very different consequences depending on where you are, okay? So let me give you a very specific example if I'm competent enough to actually change. Okay, <gasps> no. Oh, look at that. <laughs> what happened there? Then it really got crazy. Oh, gosh. That depends on what am I doing. <coughs> okay. Oh, I'm going to come back to Atif Mian if I have time. Yeah, let's, should we go to plan B? Yeah. You think that works better? Oh. It was going beautifully. Let's try that again. Shall I do it from here? Let's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, ne ne let's go to the, no, keep going. Next. <laughs> Keep going? Yes. You were about to beat yes. up Tilly. No, no, next diagram, next diagram. Next. That's it, okay, great, fantastic. Okay, so, so, so we have one chapter where we talk about what, you know, you might call this conditional comparative statics. I think we have a less nerdy uh, chapter title, like the devil in the details. But, but, so here, think of it like this, okay? Think of uh, early modern Europe, okay? So, so there's lots of warfare in early modern Europe. But different societies are in different parts of the diagram, okay? Down at the bottom, Montenegro, okay? Montenegro didn't have a state. The Montenegro was more like, you know, the Tiv than it was, uh, you know, France. Montenegro was a very decentralized place run by clans, lots of feuding, lots of conflict. There was no centralized authority at all until the middle of the 19th century, okay? So, but they were fighting like crazy. They were trying to keep the Turks out of Montenegro. Okay, this was not a peaceful place, Montenegro. So imagine Tilly's right, and you know, you have to fight a war that creates an impulse. You need a fiscal system. You know, you need to buy guns. You need to. Okay, fine. So imagine that pushes you up the diagram. Okay, it makes the state stronger. Montenegro was very far from the corridor. So all of this contestation, warfare, it didn't put Montenegro into the corridor. What about Switzerland? Well, Switzerland was also a very decentralized society in the early modern period, but Switzerland had been part of the Germanic, part of the empire of the Franks. S Switzerland had much more of a history of centralized authority, very different from Montenegro. It was very decentralized in all of these different cantons. Warfare with the Habsburgs created an impulse 
towards centralization, okay? Starting in the late 13th century with this famous charter, you know, where Uri, Schweitz, and Ulta Walden get together, and they start centralizing legal authority. And then the Swiss build this thing up from the bottom. It's a very different context where the history endowed it with much more centralized state institutions, which Montenegro never had. What about Prussia? Okay. Well, you know, the Franks were, were Germans, you know. So, so you might say, you know, why, why are you talking about Britain, England? You, know, the Magna, you should be talking about Germany. Well, I could, I could have been, and there's plenty about it in the book. Okay, so Germany has this Holy Roman Empire, lots of representative institutions, electing the king. Okay, Prussia. Prussia's a sort of, you know, there's Brandenburg, that's part of the Holy Roman Empire. There's East Prussia. That's not part of the Holy Roman Empire, so it's out of this Frankish legacy. So Prussia is a strange merger of, you know, Germanic legacy with something else, with the Teutonic Knights, let's say. Okay, but you could say, you know, if you look up until say, you know, the the Thirty Years' War in the early 17th century, Prussia's moving along in the corridor. Okay, there's this contestation between states and society. There are the estates. Then the Thirty Years' War flings it out of the corridor, okay? You get this absolutist state building project emerges, you know, and so you could say war made states. Well, it didn't, didn't make a state in Montenegro, okay? It did, it made a kind of shackle state in Switzerland. It pushed Switzerland into this path of political development that took it up to the top right-hand corner. But Prussia was thrown out of the corridor in this process of absolutist state building. Okay, so, so I think one of the power we think of this framework, kind of simplistic though it is, is it gives you a way of organizing lots of episodes in history like that. Okay, and sort of saying, you know, it's easy, it's one thing to say, oh, you know, it's, it all depends, you know, it all depends. You yeah, know, but this is, a, this is a sort of disciplined way of saying it all depends, I suppose. So, so we, hope that, we hope that's useful apart from you know, just, you know, think about the collapse of the Soviet Union, another very interesting example. The collapse of the Soviet Union, socialism collapses, you get enormously diverse outcomes from that, okay? So we also use this as a lens uh, for thinking about that. Let me talk a little bit more about Germany here because this is something that usually comes up when I talk about this. This model looks very sort of deterministic because, you know, Clovis... It's a process, I like that, you know, I like this idea of it's a process, okay? But, but then you're thinking, Hitler, you know, how shackled, how shackled was that? Bismarck, you know, Bismarck, was he shackled? Uh, so, so if you start thinking about the history of Germany, you start thinking, hold on a second, you know. So let me talk about that second, okay? So I start by emphasizing the simple picture, okay? And here's what I think is interesting about the German case, okay? Which is that, yes, Germany gets thrown out of the corridor, okay? The Thirty Years' War, the rise of this kind of absolutist state-building project. It crashes and burns, you know, at Jena in 1806. 1848 revolution, universal suffrage, the estates bounce back after they've kind of gone into hiding, you know, during the absolutist period. Then Bismarck comes with German unification, Weimar Republic. First World War, Weimar Republic. Hitler comes, the Nazi project crashes and burns, Germany bounces back. So I guess there's a lot of interesting variation there. I'm a kind of long durée person. So what I find interesting is, is the sort of, the kind of, the very low frequency persistence of this particular equilibrium in Germany. Not to say that it isn't shocked out of that by crisis, by warfare, by economic collapse. Yeah, that Germany does get kicked out of it and some crazy unstable dynamic starts, but then it gets back to where it was. So, so that's very much the end. We talk about some of that other stuff, but I just, that's, I don't want to be defensive. I'm just saying how Daron and I think about this, okay? So to me, you know, what I find sort of extraordinary, you know, about, European history is, as, as I said earlier, this kind of profusion of parliaments and representation and these notions of accountabilities and assemblies and where did that come from? 
this, you know, this, is, this is where it came from. So, so, and that seems to have created a very persistent equilibrium. If I think about the Chinese case, you know, I don't think it's that Chinese people, you know, one view is that Chinese people are different and they just don't care about liberty. You know, so if you look at what's going on in Hong Kong, <laughs> I think that's, that's, that's a remarkable contradiction to that view. Our view is very simple, you know. It's that the reason that's not happening in mainland China is people are just terrified of being repressed and disappearing into some labor camp for years. It's just power. It's about... It's about power, okay? But historically, the Chinese developed this equilibrium and, you know, maybe to some extent, a kind of intellectual system interwoven with it which has created this very slanted distribution of power. You know, Confucius said, the way comes in here again, you know, but in a government that follows the way, commoners do not debate government, okay? So, so you know, this is... I'm still thinking about this, so I shouldn't go there. But this is, this is why, you know, Fukuyama was wrong about the normative part as well, in the sense that, you know, the political economy of China is not some failed version of liberal democracy. It's a completely different model of how you organize a society politically. And, 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 and you know, uh, so, so that, but that's not in this book. This book is about power, okay? Uh, those who know me know I've never been good at philosophy. So, so it's about power, and that's the story, okay? So, so it's a very crude uh, model of, 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 you know, divergence. It's not about, you know, it seems to me the world is not about convergence. The world is very diverse, and there's, 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 this is a simple way of thinking about that variation and that diversity. And I, I you know, I, I, I hope, you know, that there's some kind of payoffs. You know, I, I emphasize this just because... I'm trying to get you to think, oh, you know, you can, ex you can understand stuff in a simple way with this framework, we hope, okay? I have some other implications here, you know. Lord Shang was wrong. He's, you know, if I was Lord Shang, I'd be happy that, you know, people were still reading me 2000, <laughs> 2000, 2003, whether I was right or wrong, 2,300 years later, you know. Uh, you know, and here's where we differ from lots of, you know, lots of people. You know, a lot of the, the research that Daron and I have done over the last decade is trying to show that this modernization idea is completely spurious. You know, this kind of Huntingtonian path of you have an autocratic state and then you know, modernization takes care of democracy. I don't think that's, that's not, that doesn't describe long-run political dynamics for me uh, at all. Okay? Getting there is not a constitutional design problem, okay? Society is crucial, okay? So I don't think, you know, the European story is not a Huntingtonian story of state or Fukuyama-esque story of, like, state first, you know, or was it rule of law first, then state, then democracy. They all came at the same time, okay? They all co-evolved together, okay? That's what, that's what I was trying to illustrate, okay? Uh, there's nothing uniquely Western about liberty either. You know, so here, you may disagree with this, and this is, you know, this is something that reasonable people can disagree with. You know, uh, there's, a, there's a kind of presupposition here that everybody likes liberty. You know, the TIV example is chosen. You know, there's many other examples like that in the book. I think Africans like liberty just as much as I do. You know, I think Chinese people would like liberty just as much as I do, but they can't, they can't have it. Maybe they can't have it for different reasons. You know, uh, that's what this theory says. But they all aspire to it, okay? The question is, how do you create an equilibrium which, which delivers it? And I think the diagram also sort of is useful for thinking about policy, right? So let me just say one more thing about policy. I, I, the, the, the reluctant though I am to talk about policy. Uh, you know, if you thought about this diagram and you said, okay, imagine you're not in the corridor, but you'd like to get into it. How would you do that? Well, it's obvious that the problem is completely different depending on where you are, okay? So, so what you need to do is very different depending on where you are in this diagram, okay? So, so again, that's something everyone kind of knows, but we hope that this is a kind of systematic way of trying to think about, about that. I mean, there's other systematic ways of thinking about it, but, but okay, so let me, I'll shut up and people can, people can ask questions. <laughs>